Every man has to come to that battleground of self-identity, fighting against the man he does not want to be, Goliath, or the man society and religion is forcing him to be, Saul. The Bible says David took off the armor of Saul and drew near to Goliath. He chose five smooth stones from a river. He used one. How many are there? We are still moving forward. While a lot of people are running away from their problems or moving away from their problems, I want you to know, unless God directs you in a direction, don't go. It can seem promising. It can show hope. But anywhere you go that God didn't tell you to go is the most dangerous place on this world. Danger is not a city. Safety is not a house. And danger is outside the Lord. And safety is in the name of the Lord. Coming back to Jersey, because we're, we're, we're bringing this to a close, wasn't something that I decided on my own. I spoke to my pastor, and it was a sacrifice. They, the school that I was at, they offered me a raise, offered me a better position as a math teacher. Um, and if you know the South, you know, the cost of living is a lot cheaper. I was okay. I remember sitting at my desk in my classroom and they gave me the contract just for me to sign and I'm reading it and I literally am thinking about my father. I'm thinking about the, his church. I'm thinking about my mother I'm thinking about my future and I just felt the heavy burden that said put your life on the altar go and heal go and restore go and repair I want to admit something it's going to take a lot of courage but I'm going to say it You see, I came with the intentions to restore and repair something that I didn't even break. And a lot of us young people, youth, we are trying to fix something our parents did. Or do something that our parents didn't do and we are working and functioning from that place of pain and hurt and we don't realize it. And we think it's a fuel for us and it can be, but that, that fuel will run out one day. I've changed my mindset. Because I failed. Don't get me wrong. I've been anointed. I've, I've blessed people. People have blessed me. God has, I've gotten married. I have a beautiful family. I'm a teacher. I'm getting paid more. I have plans. I have future. I'm, I'm good. 
Um, I failed in ministry because I've been trying to make my father proud. I failed in areas of marriage, trying to make my mother happy. Trying to recreate but a better story what my parents had or my grandparents didn't have um what i saw others did not have i said i gotta be the one to and many of us are trying to create a better story for our kids but i want you to know that that's not your responsibility you're not responsible for what happened to you you are responsible for what you do for yourself. So I'm not here restoring nothing. This podcast, me throwing my first stone, has nothing to do with anything, with anybody. I feel like my life is starting over. I feel like I'm born again. Until you come to that place where you're doing something that you were called to do that has no DNA of any other man, you've taken off that vest, that armor, and you go and pick up your stones. My friend, it may not be a stone for you, it may be a stick. It may be a piece of paper. It may be a plane. It's going to be something that is different. Something that no one thought you could do or you would do. But the fire is burning. That's what attracted Moses. It's a fire burning a bush. That same fire that's burning the bush, it's not consuming it. It's not destroying it. He looked in and he saw an angel. An angel began to speak. When you look into the word of God, what is burning? What do you see? What do you see when you pray, when you think about your calling in God? Are you called just to do the same thing someone else has done? Are you called just to fix someone else's problems? Or are you called to do something new? You see, Jesus did not just fix what Adam did. Sometimes we think that's what Jesus came to do. He didn't just fix it. He brought something new. Adam could not give us eternal life. He couldn't. I don't want to go down that tangent. It's a beautiful lesson. Adam didn't give us eternal life. Jesus came and gave us more. He gave us eternal life. You see, so while you're trying to repair something, are you being born anew? What is the new way? What is the new thing that you're doing? What is your imprint? It's not about fitting someone else's shoes. It's about being comfortable in your own shoe size. And knowing that you will never be that person and it's okay. It's all right. We, we come to a place in the Bible, in the book of Ruth. And I want to just use two stories together to fuse them together. To just kind of bring a close to testimonial part which I hope has been richly blessing you because it's me just pouring out my soul and my mind and my heart 
And I hope it's inspiring you not to just listen, but to heal. Because God is waiting for you. And real talk, he's just walking slow towards you because he's calling to do something new. He told his disciples, you will do greater things than me. A pastor once said, any organization that has their glory days in the beginning only is a dying group of people. If us as a collected body of believers, the best times in this body is when it just began. That means there's no hope. So stop telling the youth they're the future. Our message needs to be the greater days are to come. My life changed when I stopped imitating. There's a brother that says, imitation is limitation. Nick Zizi said that to me once. He's actually one of the people that inspired me to, to do this. That's why it's okay to say his name. I have to recognize those that truly inspired me. He has a podcast. He is doing his thing. And for many years, people has probably like looked it to the side. But my God, is he successful. <laughs> this is not going to reach everyone, but those that it will reach, you will change the world in a different and greater way than me. My job is to bring it to you. My job is to inspire you. The greatest teachers don't give you knowledge, does not give you lessons. The greatest teachers inspires you. Because any knowledge I give you, you can go read. We need to stop getting this notion of the best teachers are the ones that just can read information that you can also get for yourself. It's those that can inspire you to have a revelation. What made Jesus great is things that he was saying was new, fresh. And here's the thing. They're going to be new to us, but in God, they're old. Because it's the ancient things. It's, it's still giving the old gospel. Which is new light. With this new light. The book of Ruth is always looked at the story of Ruth because that's the title. But I want to look at not just the story of Ruth looking at Ruth. But I want to look at Naomi and her sons and her family. Who Ruth and God's plan was supposed to be part of that family. In the book of Ruth, it says that there was a great famine in that time. And it's during the time of famines that you're going to be exposed to who you truly are. You'll be exposed to who you are in times of famine in times of, and in times of prosperity. I'll say that again. You'll be exposed to who you are in times of famine and prosperity. There was a famine in that time. In Bethlehem, Judah. You see, Bethlehem, Judah, the place of bread, the place where Jesus was born, the place of praise. There was a famine there. The area that brought you joy, the area we used to praise the Lord at, this is going to be a time where it can dry up, but it's okay. The condition of the place does not remove the name of the place. If God gave you a church or assembly or family to be with the body of Christ, and you may feel you in a place for a season, it's dry. 
that doesn't disqualify it from its name. It's still Bethlehem, Judah. You see, this famine caused her and her family to leave. The name Naomi means pleasant one, kind. Her husband's name was Elimelech. Elimelech means my God. Anytime you see Eli, E-L-I, that means Elohim, God. Elimelech, again, Melchizedek, my God is righteous, my God is just, my God is a good God. He's a kind God. Now imagine Naomi, which is a kind and good person. We have good Christians that is in relationship with a king, with a God that is a great God, a kind God. What kind of marriage or union would that form? What kind of fruits would that produce? It tells you. Imagine you're a good person, but the condition that you're in is not good. How does that affect you? Imagine you striving. As a person, you want to strive. That's your name. That's your nature. But the environment you're in, that, there's nothing to feed from. She gives birth to two sons. You see, in these, in, in these testimonials, I, I want you guys to understand that I'm using these as types and shadows or images to show you that your job is to be fruitful. That's what God said. You're going to be fruitful. Whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you see it or not, you are fruitful. The question is, what are you fruitful in and what fruit are you multiplying? You see, Naomi was fruitful. And when you're good, you don't always produce good fruits. And when you're bad, you don't always produce bad fruits. You ever seen a good person go through hard times or a good person mess up? That happens. You ever seen a bad person, quote unquote, do good things or a bad person go through great times? We need to be careful what we call good and bad anyways. But just because you're good doesn't mean bad things can't happen. Just because you're doing everything right doesn't mean you can't mess up. Just because you're bad, quote unquote, you feel like you're not good. You're in gangs. You're a prostitute. You're a stripper. You're, you're a thief. You're a drug dealer. I don't care where you're at. That does not mean nothing good can come from you. If that's the case, then today I wouldn't be here. And even with Adam that did the worst mistake of all, Jesus would not come from that lineage, no matter what you do. Isn't it funny how God, he didn't start over with creation. He could, after Adam fell, he could have, it's like, you know what, I'm starting over. But in his mercy, he continued. And I want you to know that that's your job is to continue. Naomi married to this good king, but he made a decision to leave. Here's why. Their first son, in verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of the two sons, Mah Malon and Chilion. Stop right there. Malion and Chilion. Two sons. Again, it's about men. It's about you. These boys, these names that we're giving our sons and daughters are important. Why would this couple give their children these names? It must be good. But guess what? In Hebrew it has a meaning. You see, when God wants to talk to a group of people or when he wants to answer a prayer, here's what he would do. He would see a woman giving, is in relation with her husband, about to give birth, and then he inspires them on a name, and in, in that name he's speaking to the people. Daniel. While, while Israel's being judged, give birth to Daniel, which means God is my judge. You see what I'm talking about? He, while everyone is feeling there's no hope, Joseph, Savior. That's how God is. Ma Malon. You know what Malon means? Weakness. 
You give birth the first time you you produce malo. You a good person. You produce weakness. Okay, you, you try again. You produce chilion. You know what chilion means? Failure. Failing. If the first time fruit you produce is weakness, second fruit you produce is failure, my friend, you done. You you is like, okay, I'm I'm done with this. Because God, how can I, out of all people, be going through this? Side note, in parentheses, our young men, when you leave, the kingdom, when you leave, when you birth in a place that is dry, we, when we don't accept the challenge as young men, we do two things or we are two things. We're weak or we're attached to failure. You see, Elimelech did not want his family to fail, so he ran. He wanted to see, but failure was following him. That's what he produced. You see, when a church when a church starts or when any group starts, it starts with a lot of women. Because you don't have to go and get women. You just get a good song and they hear the music and they're coming. But men you have to go after. They say the women are the weaker vessel, but men have a hard time to face adversity. They run in famine and their family has to follow. Our, a generation has been lost because men, young men, ran in famine. Young men ran. They were weak. And they did not want to expose that weakness. Because a man only wants to show his manhood in his strengths. While, while the world is stripping us of our manhood and actually are making us weak. That's what we're running to. Vodi Bakum, which is in Apologetic that I listened to. He said, the world describes manhood in three B's. Ball, billful, bedroom. What does that mean? A man feels he's a man ball if he can play sports. He's athletic. If he's not an athlete, we like, eh, he's not really a man. It's like, that's part of manhood. Being classified as a man, what sport can you play? Number two, billful. Can you make money? How much money you have? This is how we measure manhood. Billful, ball. Number three, bedroom. How does he perform in the bed? If I can't perform, then damn, I'm not a man. If I can't satisfy her, damn, I'm not a man. This is how the world gets us. That is nothing to deal with manhood. We feel we are weak men when we can't do that. We have men that have a lot of money, but they can't even raise themselves or raise. They can't lift up a verse in their mind in the face of temptation. You see, Malon and Shilin represent our men today. Not all of us. Many. Jesus knew that he had to come. He had to leave heaven to come and grab men. Because if, if Jesus didn't go and get them, they would remain weak and remain their failures. As a matter of fact, when, you, when he got them and brought them, they still... Felt they was incompetent. Look at Gideon. And, and in their fails, they feel they're not a man. That's not the qualifier for God. Your performance at your job, on the court, in the bedroom. No. That's not what makes a man. Part of this podcast, too, is to discover true manhood. It's the graduation from brotherhood to manhood. From sisterhood to womanhood. Some women feel they're not a woman if they're not married at a certain age. They don't have a relationship at a certain age. Then it's, I don't have any children. Or my career. We need to stop using the world's metric system to measure who, our, who we are in God. We need to stop. 
she had two sons. They did not decide to change. Guess what? Elimelech and her two sons and his wife went to a place named Moab. And in Moab, they married their sons to two Moabite women. Verse 4. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah. The name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. You see, as a man, you can be weak and still get married. You could be a failure and still get married. That can happen. But if you remain weak and you remain a failure, and this is what I mean by that. If you will always be weak, you will always feel incompetent if you use the world's metric system to measure your life. This is why Jesus went and got the weak and the men that were failing. The men that were cheating. He went and got tax collectors. That's the IRS. He went and got people that, that said, give me the money. You don't think they were cheating to get more money to put in their pocket? He went and got them. He went and got, got the low lives, the ones that didn't matter, the gang members, the leaders. He went and got them. Why? To let them know that this is what qualifies you for salvation. I didn't come to those that were healed. I came to the brokenhearted. Because they need me. He didn't go get a Pharisee and Sadducee. Some people think that he was tempted to get one. He wasn't. Because in their minds, they were whole. He needed men that were truly broken. Though they were broken, they had this, the thing about it in society, they didn't have an appearance of brokenness. And this is this is what false religion does. False religion allows you to create an image of your whole, but inside you're broken. Christianity will save more when they show that they're broken, not when they're whole. Christianity has been failing because we have an appearance of holiness. In reality, we're horrible. We have holes. Christianity has been failing because it has a sign or showing an imagery of holiness. People are seeing the whole in all our mess. That's why we're failing. We're giving an image that we're not. But the day we start showing the image that we truly are, then they will wonder, then how are you guys still here? Because there's something called grace and mercy that is renewed every morning. And with, with Orpah and Ruth, they were married to these two men because those men did not want to change. God had a plan. Here's what it was. They were there for 10 years. They didn't go there when they were babies, no. They were there, young, and after that, 10 more years. They grew up there. Verse 5, And Malon and Chilion died. And my brothers, my brothers, my brothers, if you remain in that condition in your heart, you will die. Just because you stay in church doesn't mean that you're not weak. Or you're not a failure. When you fail to grow. When you fail to heal. You don't think that traumatized the parents. To know like we are good people. Why is bad things happening to us? You know how I know it traumatized them? They stopped having kids. They said if God did this once. God did this second time. God alright I learned. But that's not what God wanted. They stopped. And the reason why men and women, us, all of us, churches, we remain in the area of failure. We remain with the weakness. 
because our trauma has caused us to be stagnant or unfruitful. Churches die because the trauma of the failures, the trauma of the weaknesses in the people and in us, and we says, you know what, That's we're done. There's no hope. Why keep trying? Coming back to church doesn't mean you keep trying. Sometimes coming to church just means attendance. I've accepted the condition of the church. Some people stop trying and they switch out because they're like, you know what, I'm just who I am. I'm never going to change. And you accept failure. You accept to be weak. My friend, if you do, you will die. This is what the story of Naomi's sons represent. Ruth and Orpah are married to them. So, sisters. I know some of y'all are happy I'm finally talking to y'all directly. Sisters, even if your husband is weak, that don't mean you got to be weak. Your name is Ruth. Your name is Orpah. You could be a Moabite. They could have found you. And they was helping you spiritually. They end up dying. And you're the hope of the family. Spiritually. Just because your husband is a failure. Doesn't mean you have to fail. Spiritually. Even in life. And if he dies. That doesn't mean your life is all over. In our churches. A lot of the young men left. And died off. And the sisters stayed. My sisters, even if the brothers leave, remain faithful to your church. Let me give you a secret. Jesus went and got the disciples. When he died and resurrected, it was the women that were there first. And it was a sister that went and told the man, Jesus is risen. There is going to be a sisterhood that is going to rise. And it's going to preach to young men as if Jesus is still alive. He is not dead. And they will call boys to men. They will awaken a generation of apostles that are sleeping. The women. Remember that. There's going to be a sister that's going to bring to rise and to awaken young boys that are sleeping in church. They're gifted, but they're sleeping. Sisters, you're not going to give, you're not going to wake them up by just singing. And testifying about your life. But you're going to have to preach the gospel. The risen Christ. That's why with all of you. Get understanding. Get this gospel. Learn it. Live it. Don't limit yourself. To just a testimony. And a song. But preach Jesus. Priest Jesus has been crucified and is dead and he's now alive forevermore. Glory to God. Thank God there was a Ruth. Naomi, her husband died. Her sons died. But Ruth decided to stay with Naomi even if her husband died. And I want you guys to know this. In order for you to become Boaz, you have to die as Shilion and Mahlon. A lot of brothers, they, they want to be Boaz and they want to be Shilion. You can't be both. Here's the example that we have from the Bible. The eldest must die. The first must die. So the second can come to life. Ruth's salvation began when she buried failure. 
when God uh, allowed Naomi to bury her sons and her husband, that was another level of trauma. But God needed her to bury the failures and the weaknesses she felt she had. Even her thinking that her strength came from the man she married. God wanted her to know that it's not what you're attached to on this earth that gives you strength. But it's what I put in you that's your strength. You see, the strength of the eagle is renewed day by day as the feathers fall off. His strength is renewed. I feel like I'm speaking to someone that has been looking for strength in all the wrong places. It's been looking everywhere for what they're looking for. and But what they're looking for is inside of them. And they haven't taken the time to look inside them. Today I want you to know to look inside of you. For what is in you is greater than what's outside of you, what's inside them. Paul says, it's not me who lives, but it's Christ that is living in me. You see, it's what's in you that is your strength. Naomi was traumatized twice by the birth of her sons and by the death of her sons. In so much... That Naomi, she looked at her daughters as her daughter in law. I want to say her daughters after her boys is buried and dead. She's like, I have nothing to give you. I'm nothing. And sometimes, because you have not produced anything yet, you forget that you still can produce something. You are the source, Naomi. No matter what it looks like, you still remain a source. And Ruth understood that. Ruth says, listen, your God will be my God. It doesn't matter what we went through, Naomi. The God that we serve is greater than this trauma. Naomi's like, no. Are you sure? No, I don't think I, this is not right. The Bible says that when Ruth decided to go with Naomi, Oprah said, you know what? I'm good. And that's the thing. Remember that. Because Naomi's heading back home now. See, remember, that's the message. You have to go back to the place where it all began. You have to. Even if the fruits didn't come out of you, Naomi. God sometimes allows fruits to come from you that you didn't even think can come. Ruth became Naomi's daughter. That didn't even come from her womb. But she raised her. You will have so much influence that you have influence over people that's not even your own children. Naomi had to go back to the place where she first got hurt. How can I be in a place, God, where I'm good and you allow me to suffer at home? Naomi couldn't even feed her kids. Her going back there reminded her of how she could not provide as a mother for her home. She didn't want to go back. But she had no choice. And God sometimes does that. Puts you in a place where you have no choice but to go back. And she went back. Orpah said, listen, what I went through with you, Naomi, already is too much. I can't go. Ruth said, listen, where you go, I shall go. That's the difference. Some of us, we cannot overcome the trauma because we can't go back. We're like, where that happened, I can't go. Your Orpah. You can't, you, you can't, you're not ready yet, but you can't grow if you can't go there. Ruth said, I will go. Ruth going back, the name Ruth means friend, friendship. Restore at least a friendship. Forgive to restore at least a friendship. Ruth, Naomi is, is God is saying, listen, Naomi, take Take the spirit of friendship back. Remember, I have not left you. I'm still your friend. And everyone else that may not have been affected like you, remember, they're your friends too. Most importantly, I'm your friend. Take Ruth. 
Naomi is like, I'll go back, but I'm going to change my name. Look at this in chapter one. When she went back into the city, verse 19, into Bethlehem, people said, is this Naomi that came back? People was people was surprised because it was like, we know she just left and she's back alone. Like, I know I thought they would never come back because I know that this thing damaged them for life. Naomi came back more damaged than she left. And sometimes what happens when you leave the thing that that person did to you later as life progressed, you get hurt even more. Then God asks you to go back. Come on, God, is this you? Yes, it's you. You're back. We're back. Go back. Then it says, verse 20, and she said to them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Lord Almighty have dealt with me bitterly. A lot of us are calling ourselves Mara. Remember, that's the, that's the first place that God brought Israel when he crossed the river. It's, the, it's that river, Mara, that, that little place, Mara, bitterness. And they had to drink the, the water of bitterness. And it was important that they drank it. They called it Mara because it was bitter. They had to. So you have to drink it. You have to deal with the pain. What I like in the story of Naomi, she called herself Mara. You read the rest of the book. No one else does. Not even God. Not even Ruth. Not even Boaz. Because sometimes you condemn yourself for a situation you're going through. And God understands. But he will never condemn you for that. I want to let someone know tonight. Today, this morning. You don't change your name. God knows your name. Don't condemn yourself because of what you're going through in your marriage. Some people are sad right now. Some people that just got married. They've been married for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. And in reality, you're saying, yo, my name is Maya. I don't like my marriage. I'm miserable. I hate it. But I got to show everybody I'm Naomi. And some of us, we can't even show name. We, we really show like, yo, call me Mara. I've suffered. I've lost too many kids. Or I'm losing my husband. I'm losing my mind. I'm bitter. I want you to know that that's not your story. Your story is you're a mother that can produce. Here's what Naomi didn't know. If she would have kept producing food, she would have one day produced her own, Ruth. She didn't have to go somewhere to get her, but from her own belly. And sometimes because we can't produce it, God has to put it next to us. And said, you see what you could have had? If you would have kept going. So stop fighting. Keep producing. Don't let what has happened to you make you feel there's no more hope for you. Don't judge yourself like that. Don't allow what others have done to affect how you feel for the rest of your life. That's the story of Jonah. A lot of us don't know that. The story of Jonah is similar to this, but in a different way. A lot of people think that Jonah was actually running away. Like they teach us he's running away from ministering to people. Jonah's not, it's not just about running away you need to find out why he did it. And a lot of us are judging people wrong because we don't know why they're doing what they're doing. A lot of youth ran away from church because we don't know why. Last week, I talked to one of my closest friends. And I was like, why did you leave church? She was like, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. I've been suffering this for the last five years. I got off the phone and cried. You never know what someone is going through. You don't know why Jonah left. Did not want to go to Nineveh. Let me share this with you. You see, 
Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, arise and go to Nineveh. Do you know what Nineveh is or was? In 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 36, Nineveh was a city in Assyria. What, is, what is, does that do anything? Assyria was one of the nations that was battling or always at war with Israel. Jonah did not want to go there because he lost his family. His country was losing battles to them. They were trying to wipe his family out. And some historians, some things that I've read said that they actually killed his family, his whole village, the Syrians. If you don't know who the Syrians are, how vicious they were, the Syrians actually is the one that came up with the idea of crucifixion to, to slowly kill you and bring you close to death without dying. The Syrians came up with that. Think about Jesus that got crucified. The Romans the master, they made it a sport. The Syrians came up with that. The Syrians will create ways on how to torture and kill people. That they will suffer for months and not die. Now, I lost my family. Our country is at war with them. And you want me to go there? You know how much they hurt me? Come on. I'd rather fail. It's my weakness. I don't care. Malon and Shilion. All over Jonah. I'm hurt right now. I'm weak. No, no. Preach to them? No. Jonah would not go. Why do I have to preach to the person that hurt me? Why am I going to go and give them this message? That's the story of Jonah. God is saying, go. Jonah's like, why do you even have them even in your hearts? Why do you want to save these kind of people? Destroy them. No matter how far Jonah ran, God says, you're going to deal with this issue. You're going to go back to them. You're going to go to them. Jonah said, watch. Jonah went to this deepest sea, into the well, said, I'm good here. I'd rather remain weak. That well brought him right there. You know what Jonah said? Jonah said, God, why put me through this? Because Jonah looked at it from him, how they affected him. He didn't, and that's what happens when we remain in a place of hurt. We don't look at them healing. Because here's the thing, if the person that hurts you heals, then they won't go around hurting a lot of people. Because most of the time, 90% of the time, you're not the only victim of that person. So, Sending them to jail is not always the answer. Yes, they should pay a price if it's needed. But if they are healed, not only would you save them, but even the son that comes from them won't do the same thing their father did. That saves your daughter. That's what God sees. If I can save them, then maybe in the future, my own son won't have to die on the cross. If they can be saved, Jonah, maybe your children, children will have to suffer from the hands of the Syrians. So my brothers suffer for the kingdom of God. Jonah said, I, this message is so strong, God. I know if I preach it, they're going to change. God is like, that's exactly the point. Jonah goes and sits down. And after that, Jonah is like, man, the sun is beating on me. It's really hot. I can't rest. So God, because Jonah needed a shadow, a shade. God allowed from the ground to grow a small plant big enough to cover Jonah. And God, Jonah's like, oh my God, thank you, God. And God said, you see, it took me time to understand that, part, that portion. Like, why would that even be there? Why is that important? God is showing Jonah, you care about your, you being comfortable. What about them? 
Don't they need a shade from my judgment? Don't they need a hope in what can happen to them? The book of Jonah shows Jonah learned that lesson and realized that here's the part I want to attach. Jonah realized the reason why he couldn't forgive is because he had pride. And he cared about his own comfortability than the salvation of a whole nation. And a lot of us, it's our pride that won't allow us to forgive. Because if I forgive them, then God, you're going to bless them. God, I still need them to be underneath your punishment. God, I don't want them to be saved. They need to burn in hell. They need to burn in my hell. Leave them in the grave. Bury them where there's no hope. God, remove them from the memories of anyone. God says, no. If I can forgive you that has killed them in your heart, then I can forgive them because they didn't kill you. Jonah preaches. And guess what? They repent. Jonah says, all right, God, you got it. He preached. He gave them the message. Guess what? They, they, they repented. They changed because he brought the message. You see, a lot of us are the tools God wants to use to save the person that hurt us. We're afraid for God to use us because we're afraid to be a victim again. I came myself vulnerable. But God is not sending you Joseph as an older brother. He's sending you as the second in command. And life and death is in your hands. God is sending Jonah not really to save them. He's sending Jonah to save himself. Because if you can't forgive, you can't save your own self. Forgiveness is a part of healing. And to show that you're healing, you have to forgive. Jonah could not forgive them for what they did to his people. A lot of us are still cursing people. Or don't want to help anybody because of what they did to our friends. Not even to us. We're still alive. We're fighting someone else's battles. Yes, it, it traumatized us. This is funny in the in the story of Nineveh and Jonah. There's a there's another prophet, the book of Nahum. It's a couple books after. Nahum. Nahum is another prophet that later on goes to Nineveh. Go and read it. It's a couple of chapters, maybe three. And guess what? After Jonah preached the gospel for them to change, guess what? They still didn't change. They changed for a little bit, then went back to what they was doing. Nahum said, this blood, this city full of blood. Because they wouldn't change. Because they didn't allow the message to change their hearts fully. That the generations can change from their wicked ways. God took vengeance on Nineveh. The, the book of Nahum is to say, Jonah, you did your part. Now you can be saved and you're free. The book of Nahum is God saying, oh, y'all don't want to change. Vengeance is mine. In the last chapter of Nahum, chapter 3, verse 19, that's what he says. Let's start verse 18. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gather them. God says, you will be nothing now. Assyria. And later on, literally, Another nation comes and destroys the Assyrians. 
Verse 19, here's why. Because there is no healing of thy bruise. You see, they never healed. They never changed. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap at the hand over thee. Because you never healed. Because you never changed. You allowed it to consume you. People that's going to clap and say yes. People were happy that Assyria and Nineveh was destroyed. Because they never changed. I want you to know this too. The people that's going to be really happy. Clapping. If you are never healed. To end. I'm testifying because I'm healing. And in many areas I, have, I am healed in the name of Jesus. But are you? Who has God called you to go and speak to. To forgive and ask forgiveness from. That you're running away from. But if you did. It will save you. We don't know if it will save them. But if it doesn't. Let go and let God. But do your job. The last book of the Old Testament. Malachi. To end. Help us Lord. In chapter 4. Behold I will send Elijah the prophet. Before the coming of the great. And dreadful day of the Lord. We all know that Elijah was John the Baptist. Verse 6. Here's why. Here's how the Old Testament ends. Brothers. And he shall turn their heart. Of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. He's going to save man. His solution to saving man, kind, is to bring fathers to their children. Say it a different way to turn the hearts of the fathers to their sons. To turn the hearts of the sons to their fathers. Because if that doesn't happen. I will come. And smite the earth. With a curse. This world is cursed. Because the son of God Adam. Turned his heart. Towards his father. Then Adam's son. Turned. Cain. Turned his heart. From his father. Before the Old Testament ended. God had to say listen. I have to send the prophet. To say something. Here's the purpose. Everything was working well when a father and a son was working together. They didn't have to be together. But their hearts had to be towards each other. The heart of the father must be first turned to the heart of his son. And the heart of the son must be turned to the heart of his father. I want to invite you Let's go on this journey together using the four stones. Remember, being spiritual is not just doing what the Bible says alone, but it's becoming the very word himself. Hallelujah!